two buildings with these phylogenetic trees. So let me start with the theorem from last time. Every phylogenetic tree T arises as the incidence the graph to a tree T with n leaves arises as the incidence graph T equals gamma of x of a string x in yn. Maybe we should <coughs> maybe we should put here a more specific name. If you have an idea how we could call these strings to give them an adjective, so I want to put something here which makes them kind of unique. We need a good name for these strings. Okay. And uh, I will do I will give you again the idea of the proof, but now I will do it uh, differently, or slightly differently in a more general way. What we'll do is we, we interpret such a tree T as the composition, as a certain composition of smaller trees. So let me write this. We will use the composition or if you want, or gluing of trees. And whenever I say tree, I mean a phylogenetic tree. OK, so we let, let S, T be two phylogenetic trees. And let U, V, so u in s, I write it like s, like this, v in t be two selected inner extremal vertices. So what do I mean? Inner is clear, they are not leaves. We, distinct, we choose in each of the trees one such vertex, and extremal means that it has only one inner edge, extremal, only one inner edge. Inner edge is an edge connecting it to an inner vertex. I will make the drawing, and then you will easily see what I mean. So I'm not sure if I can do it here. Maybe, yes, I think I can do it here. Let's see if this works. My blue. Blue are the inner vertices. And this one will be here, my U. And then we will have a couple of leaves here which I draw in yellow or orange. So I, we have always at least two. And maybe we have something here. I don't care. And then we have the neighbor. This will, so this was S. So this pen is already running out of liquid. Let me try with this one. Yeah, this looks to be better. So again. Maybe we have something like this. Doesn't matter too much how it looks over here. This will be our vertex V. This will be T. And then you already see, you cannot avoid to glue these two. Here we have the, assume that we have here just two leaves. And then we have further leaves somewhere here. Something. OK. And how do we glue? So we choose one leaf, which I call M. And this one I call N. So here, this 
tree S will have a label set which I call capital M, and here I call it capital N. Okay? And M will be a leaf which is sitting as U and N in N. This, the leaf with label N will be sitting at V. And now we connect them here. And how do we do this? So we define S star T, very simple operation. We replace these two edges here by just one blue edge. So maybe I write it here. Let's try in red. So I don't have to draw the whole graph again. So we eliminate these two. And then we build a bridge here. This is a new edge. OK. So maybe I should write something here. Uh, replace the chosen leaves in S at u and in t at v by a new edge connecting u with v. OK? Is this clear what we mean? And I hope it is clear to you that S star T, which will be the composition, is again a phylogenetic tree. So S star T is again a phylogenetic tree that's quite obvious with label set P. Now what is P? We take out m, small m from capital M, union n minus n. And here it is useful to not to enumerate the labels. We just take finite sets, capital M and capital N. OK? Any question? Uh, yeah. Um, why this restriction on where you can, how to say, glue together? Why well, you don't take inner vertices and, and uh, glue them like to extremal ones, for example? Because it works. That's not a good answer. But actually, what is behind here is that we represent our space script YN. This space here will be represented as a fiber product. Yeah, what is behind? So if I write now Y capital M to indicate the label set, OK? And if we take Y capital N, then we have a kind of fiber product. So this is not the usual Cartesian product, but the fiber product uh, above something, which I don't want to specify. So maybe in quotation marks. And this will be then isomorphic to Y P. This will appear in more detail in the notes. Okay, and that's precisely the construction which works. Okay, and of course, what is clear that the cardinality of p is larger than the cardinality of m, and the cardinality of n, so we can apply induction. Okay. So <clears throat> this is one of the constructions one can do with phylogenetic trees, and they have a geometric meaning for the strings. And in this, and you also have. This kind of isomorphism for the moduli spaces. If you look at the compactification of Delin, Knudsen, Mumford, there also appears such a fiber product for overline capital uh, script M0N. Okay? So that's the combinatorial counterpart of these fiber products. Uh, just a question slash remark about the previous question, because um, to glue two extremal inner vertices together, all we have to do is delete two leaves, right? And then create a new edge between them. Yes. I choose the leaves yeah. at u and at v. Of course, it depends on the choice of the leaves, but I don't care so much. I need, what I need will be this one, because now I can apply induction. 
Yes, and if we tried gluing together a non-extreme inner vertex with an extreme inner vertex, this construction wouldn't work because you'd need to delete part of the inner graph. Yes. And that might present some problems. So maybe that's another reason why you don't do it. Yes, it's and I. Really and yes, yes. <laughs> It's a little bit complicated to explain, but if you, you can think at it at home and you will see that that's the good way to do it. And you don't do it at a, at a vertex which is not extremal. Okay? In any case, you just need one construction to do it. Uh, then you are happy if it works. Yeah? Okay, more questions. Paul, you had a question? Uh, yeah, uh, Paul, just um, from a combinatorial point of view, we would not have to delete the leaves. We could just connect. We could just create and a new edge and then connect. Um, but I guess the reason why we don't do this is also because the other construction works better. Yes, deleting the leaves has a certain advantage. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> but because we can also go backwards. We can, we can also cut a big tree into smaller ones. And when we delete one edge, no, if we delete this red edge, it could be that the condition of degree at least three is violated. And that's why we will have to add, no? maybe I can make a side remark. If we have something like this, I draw in red the one we want to delete. If we have something like this and, and just one leaf, so this would be u and v. I hope you can see it. Then we are not allowed. To, to delete this red edge without creating new leaves. Okay? So that's why the opposite is deleting a leaf. Okay? So this is what we call the cutting decomposition. You delete this one. Okay? So by induction, and now you see how, how nice all this works. Uh, if we, we assume that for m and n and the trees s and t, we can already find our, our strings. So we assume that s is gamma of x, t is gamma of some y. Okay. Uh, and for and now I will use a different notation. Instead of writing here an index a small number, I will write capital M as before and y a string in y n. So this means just these are the incident sets. And what we want to do, we want to find, find a string z in y capital P with gamma z equal s star t. And you agree that by this construction you get all trees, all phylogenetic trees. Yeah. So, <clears throat> of course, one should not forget about the, the starting point. When we have just one inner vertex, that's uh, the starting case, but that's the generic string. So, if S is a generic tree, and recall it looks like this. Then we know we know what x is. It's it's just a generic string. Okay. Harry. Yes. Uh, sorry, once more. I forgot the definition of generic string. The generic string is you take an n on x equals x one up to x n in P one. N, and the condition is that the 
entries are pairwise distinct. That's what is a generic n-gon. And then you send it to the string x, which is just the symmetrization of x. Okay, so where you take all, I don't repeat what this was, this was a symmetrization. It just means that you repeat the n-gon, but you place the entries at the position 0, 1, and infinity according to your triple indicating the n-gon. Okay. So a generic string is the uh, symmetrization of a generic n-gon. Right, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that's actually the open stratum where everything is already known. Okay. So, uh, sorry, does this mean that I can like cut any tree into some kind of product of generic trees? Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's what I did also uh, the last time when I decomposed just one small part. Yeah, you, if you remember the picture at the end of the le lecture last time, it was also the same construction, but the decomposition, cutting off a generic part of the tree. Okay. So, uh, da -di -da -dum. I have to erase. So now we let me come back here. You can see here. So we have x and we have y, and we want to construct a z which has now many more components. Yeah, and that's a little bit tricky, but not too difficult. And I try to, maybe I try to do it here. Uh, I don't want to give you just the the formulas. I want to give you the feeling how you do it. So, if you have in in this here s. If you have a, an n-gon xt, this corresponds to an orbit here. Okay. So how many how many entries does an n-gon here as a, as a, a gon here has? It has as many entries as we have leaves here. So the, that m are the leaves here. Okay. So. This xt will be in p1. Now I write it like this, m. No? As many entries as the label set m tells us. And we want to extend it to a, the zt should be in p1 p. So we need many more entries. But at the end, we know how this graph will look like. And it's rather easy. For the labels here, we already know what xt is. So only the new labels will be these here. So we have to add entries here, which correspond to these labels here. You agree? But we know already, we know already the entry of xt at this label here, m, which we have deleted. Okay. Now, as we go here through this edge, everything which comes here must have the same entry. No? The entries corresponding to the labels here, they must all be equal. And the only natural choice is this entry here, xtm. So, I think I, I keep this graph and I write it here. <clears throat> I think this the the approach is clear. Oh, where do I have my So the best thing is, of course, to do it yourself. But <laughs> so 
So let me write this down. Want to define Z, which will be T, T are tripled in P over 3. No? And we want to define this from the knowledge of the strings x and y. I hope this is clear. So now how do we do this? This, we have to do it for every t. And here, t may have different locations inside p. t will be a triple in p. t is i, j, k, triple in p. And recall, p was m minus m union n minus n. Okay. So it could be that t is entirely in m minus m. That's the first case. So if t already belongs to m minus m3, so this would correspond to a vertex here, yeah? then we put z, now I have to be careful, z t i will be defined x t i as long as i is in m minus m. No? These z t i correspond to labels which are here, except this one. And if i is not one of these, so if i is over here, if i is in n minus n, recall that small m and small n do not exist anymore, it will be constant z i t. For all i, it is constant. And the only choice will be x t m. That's the definition. Now, of course, the situation is symmetric. If t in n minus n over 3, symmetric definition, and then we have the last case. <clears throat> so we did this one. And corresponding t inside here corresponds that we are not u. We are not at u. So the last case is if t is not in m minus m over 3, union n minus n over 3. So this means that <clears throat> two components, i and j, are either in m. And the other one is in n, or the opposite. So without loss of generality, ij in m minus m and k in n minus n. This corresponds of sitting here. Okay. Now in this case, the definition uh, zt, the orbit will correspond to u. I leave this to you to check. And we define, uh, now I need a new index, ZTL will be XTL for L in M minus M. So the same as before. And ZTL will be defined infinity for L in N minus N. I'm sorry. Yes. In the line above, do we want to have it UTL instead of XTL? Um, here? Yeah, here, exactly. No, U, U is just the name for the vertex. Okay, of course, yeah. it's the same. I mean, the U is the orbit of XT in this case, yes. So this, yeah, yeah this would be 
xt. You can write it in both cases. Yeah? Now, why infinity? Because uh, x t m Do I say nonsense? I think I wanted to leave to you. No, sorry, because almost. I don't want to enter too much in detail, but our k, which we have here, the k will be in n minus n. So k is somewhere here, and of course we will have we must have z t k equal infinity because t is i j k. You remember the entries at the at the in, at the i j k must be zero one infinity. So we have this one, and it must be equal around here. Let's complete the definition. Okay. Now, of course, you have to check that this works, but it's a almost trivial check I'm not going to do here. So check that this, this is OK. It's a little bit of fooling around, but it's very funny because you draw this picture, and then you see how it goes. Okay. So of course, this construction depends on the choice of the two vertices u and v and of these leaves here. So you see, the system works on its own. The only point here is to define this properly. And for this, you know already what you expect. That's something which is a lot of cheating in mathematics. If you know already what you expect, you define it precisely so that it will be this one. Okay? And then you prove that the properties are OK. That's something you often do when you want to prove uh, the existence and uniqueness of an object. You first prove the uniqueness. And from the uniqueness, you know how the object should look like. And then you almost have the existence. Okay. So that's this, this composition argument. Of course, it's, it's more difficult to, to explain than to prove it yourself. <coughs> So what I want to do today is <clears throat> I don't want to give you a com complete proof, but I want to repeat the flavor which we have in this theory using the combinatorics of these phylogenetic trees. The next thing is also very nice. Of course, I mean, I'm making my own publicity, which is maybe not correct, but uh, <clears throat> so I, I emphasize that many of the ideas and constructions I'm presenting here are not mine. So I learned almost everything of this from Joseph Schicho and Cia Yue Ki. And Joseph is just overwhelming with ideas and proposals. And then you just have to verify that it works. So the next one is the smoothness theorem. The variety script y n inside Zn of strings x with at least three pairwise distinct entries and n-gons xt having equal cross ratios cross q x t equals cross q x s for all q 
quadruples q i j k l in n over 4. Whenever they are defined, whenever both are defined, so this is just a repetition of the definition of script yn. This variety is smooth. E -A. a manifold of dimension n minus 3. It's also irreducible, but we don't prove this at the moment. So that's uh, one of the results of Mumford Knudsen. Of course, if you transcribe it for m0 n bar, which will be shown to be isomorphic to our yn. So idea of proof. So remember that we had, a, let me say something about the dimension. Uh, we had m0n sitting inside yn yeah, via symmetrization. And this has dimension. Uh, n minus 3, because if you have an n gon x, these are the pairwise distinct, the generic, generic entries, then up to PGL2, you can bring this x is equivalent to 0, 1, infinity, x, 4, up to xn, and here you see that this belongs to p1 n minus 3. Okay. So if you take the orbit, it will be this. This is a space of orbits of the generic n-gons. You will have dimension n minus 3. So of course, we what we know is that m0 n bar, no, maybe I should not write it like this, but uh, we expect yn to have dimension n minus 3 because yn should be equal to the Zariski closure, uh, xn. Later, and this will be in March, xn equal yn. But this is the Zariski closure. of Vn, Vn was defined uh, as the image of under symmetrization of this one here, and this is of dimension n minus 3. So it's good to know the dimension even though without proving it at the beginning, because we know where we will go with our charts. Therefore, our charts to prove that yn is a manifold should go to a n minus 3 k. Now here I'm over an arbitrary field, let's say, of characteristic 0. So I think my pen is not working well. Let me just take a minute to get a better one. So I'm back again. So let me draw a picture. Uh, it's always difficult to draw a picture, but I draw it as a sphere. Assume this is yn. And inside, we have this 
So this is closed, and inside we have this open subset which I draw like this. This would be this Vn. Okay. And in order to prove that Yn is smooth, we will cover it by charts. And what we will do is, here inside it's already OK. So we will pick a point here that's what I call the boundary. And we will take a neighborhood of this. So let me call this. The element here will be a string x. And we take something which I draw like this as a neighborhood. So this Vn is not good here. Excuse me. So we have Vn is the open dense subset. And according to our string, we will define here Wx. So Wx is an open neighborhood of x. And we can take it in yn minus vn. Okay. Now, this, what we call the boundary, these are the strings which are not generic. Inside here, in vn, we will have the generic one. And in the boundary, we have non-generic ones. But you can be more or less generic. So the idea here is choose x in yn minus vn. I don't know how to call it as specific or as little generic as possible. I will specify in a moment what I mean. <clears throat> and then we will define the neighborhood Wx. If the union of the Wx covers the whole Yn, we'll be done. Define Wx. Prove that we get an open covering of Yn and prove that Wx is smooth. And it will be smooth by proving that it is isomorphic to something inside here, but something open. So actually, it will be, let me write it like this, k star n minus 3. So this is just. Uh, a, I don't know how to write it, a1 minus 0 over k n minus 3. So we take out uh, 0 from the line, and then we take the n-fold Cartesian product. So that's just the complement of the coordinate axis of the coordinate hyperplanes in a1 to the n minus 3. This is sitting in a n minus 3. Okay. So I'm not sure if I will make a break here. I think we can continue because it's the last section and it is uh, we are just in the mood of continuing. So <clears throat> I learned this again from Joseph Schicho and from Tsaiyue Ki. So you, what does it mean to be as little generic as possible? So I will call I will say x is called extremal and this will be here the new word for little generic x is called extremal if gamma of x remember this is a phylogenetic tree so generic means that you have one vertex and many leaves and extremal is just the opposite yeah. So you have as many vertices as possible, but they have very few inner edges. And the minimal number of degrees is 3. So x is called extremal if gamma x 
has inner vertices of degree 3 only. Okay. So how does this look like? Uh, of course, you may have ramifications. But you always only have what is called bifurcations. It is also called bifurcated tree. By, in combinatorics, you call it the bifurcated tree. So what you do, you choose a root in combinatorics, and you move, and you always have two ways to branch. Okay. And then, of course, you just have, at all endpoints, you just have two leaves. So this will be our gamma of x. We are not allowed to add here a leaf inside or to add a further edge. Okay. So every, every vertex is trivalent. Yes, you call it also trivalent. Trivalent mm -hmm. tri vertices. Yeah. Some people call it valence, some people call it degree. I don't know. Yes. And now, <laughs> now you can guess something. Let us do a short guess. How many, how many inner edges does such a tree have? Don't think about it before you answer so we can, everybody can think about it. Or maybe you write it in the chat. That's a maybe a good way to have a short break. Write your answer in the chat. How many edges does an extremal tree have? You can count here. Not too much response yet. So let's do a count in the example. And then we might guess it. So we have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16 leaves. So this is n. I'm not happy. And we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Twelve edges. Thirteen edges? Yes, I'm confused. Let me, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Oh, yeah, this was a big shock. 13. And this is, of course, n minus 3. OK, so answer by exercise. You do one example, and then you believe it. We have n minus 3 edges in such a tree. OK, now here. We need the chart maps. Chart maps have should go to n minus three, so they should have n minus three components. Okay. So what we do now is the following. Uh, da -dee -da -da. We define first our neighborhood Wx. That's definition of neighborhood x of x. This goes as follows. Uh, I write it like this. 
Now this should be called y. We take the strength y in yn. Now I have to write the whole sentence. Such that cross q of y is defined and different zero and different infinity for all quadruples q in n over 4 for which the cross ratio of x with respect to this quadruple is 1. That's the definition. Okay, It works, and it will be an open neighborhood. This has to be proven. I'm not going to do it now. Okay. Uh, why is it open? Because it's given by inequalities. The cross ratio is continuous. So this will be in Yn open, because cross ratio Uh, continuous. So it's a precise definition, but we don't understand it. We don't care. Yeah, I just want to give you the main input. So now we will do the following. Uh, I think I have to draw. I have to draw my graph again. Or maybe I can do it here. If you allow me, I do it here. We choose now choose for every inner edge E of gamma of x. So let's, for instance, take this one here, E. Maybe I should write it in blue. We do the following construction. Uh, for every pavon, labels i, j, k, l in n over 4 as follows. That's now a funny construction. We delete the edge e, delete e from gamma x, together with its two endpoints. So let me draw this for this graph here. We get something like this. And here we have our leaves. So we get now this we get four connected components. We get four connected graphs. And uh, what we do to the, get these labels i, j, k, l, I repeat, the labels will be attached to the leaves. We take in each component, here, for instance, we take the label with the smallest value. So uh, let me write it here, i, j, k, l, in each component take the smallest label. 
So this will define a quadruple up to a permutation, but you can exclude, make this precise, q equals i j k l. And this q will depend on e. This is an e, because it corresponds to the deletion of e. You agree? <clears throat> now you may ask how you order these here. Uh, you can order them increasingly to make them unique. Okay. So we have defined quadruples. Now we define our chart maps. So of course, if you wish, I can do the details and the proofs of all this in March, or at least put it in the notes. So define alpha x. This now goes from this open neighborhood to a 1 minus 0 n minus 3. If we take here y, now what happens? If we take the cross ratio of y, by definition of w of x, the cross ratio will never be 0 or infinity. So what we take here is just the n minus 3 tuple of cross ratios with respect to qe. e is an edge of gamma of y. And this goes over e edge of gamma x. Okay. So we take all these cross ratios and surprise this is bijective and biregular. Okay. One proves and I'm not going to do it, but using this decomposition in four components, one proves that alpha of x is bijective. It's not very complicated. The problem was, of course, to define the right alpha. Alpha and thus defines the manifold structure. On yn equal the union of all these Wx, x extremal. Okay. I think that's nice, even though you have to dig into the proof, but it's half a page to write down the details. And you see that, again, it's very much inspired by these trees. Any questions for this? This is the smoothness. If there are no questions, I want to use the last 20 minutes or 25 minutes to come back to the stable curves. Okay. Uh, this is something uh, which relates really this theory to the theory of Delin, uh, Knudsen, and Mumford. Okay. So I can erase here already. And as you already guess, the construction of stable curves is again very elementary. And uh, we'll use again the inspection of phylogenetic trees. I hope that I can at least. <clears throat> So 
So I don't have time to give you a complete picture of this, but at least the main idea, reconstruction of endpointed stable curves from strings. So let me recall that the notion of n-pointed stable curves was a big step in the theory of moduli, yeah, because these n-pointed stable curves are precisely the object where you find a nice moduli space. Okay. Now, I will do the opposite. Not knowing anything about n-pointed stable curves, we will look at the construction, and they will pop up on their own. OK? And this goes as follows. Uh, consider the forgetful map pi. We could also call it a projection. We go. Now we take a larger label set with one label more, and we go down to yn. And how do we do this? Now, <clears throat> it is just forgetting everything which is related to n plus 1 as the composition. So recall, this is sitting, yn is sitting inside p to the p1 to the n times n2, 3. So we take p1. Now this one is sitting in n plus 1, n plus 1, 2, 3. And the first thing is, so we, here we have n plus 1 gons. What we do is, by, from these n plus 1 gons, we cut off the last entry. So we get to p1 n times n plus 1, 3. Yeah, so this cut off last entry in each n plus 1 gone. Just forget it. So then we will get a bunch of n gons here, but we get too many because we have, of course, more triples than before. So the next we take, we forget all those triple which involve t plus 1. So we take p1 n n plus 1, 3, going to p1 n n 2, 3. And here we forget all n guns whose triple is not in n over 3. So this means the triple ijk yeah, involves either i or j or k is n plus 1, e.g. k equals n plus 1. So this gives this projection map. Okay? It's just forgetting everything which has to do with n plus 1. Do you agree? Now, I have to take some water. <clears throat> Where do our stable curves live? Let x be in yn a string with n gons of n gons and consider its fiber pi inverse of x inside y n plus 1. Okay. So this consists of y's, string y's of n plus 1 gons, n plus 1, pi of y 
physics. Okay, so everything which is not related to n plus 1 is already prescribed by x in y. And free are only entries which relate to n plus 1. Okay, so theorem. For all x the fiber a pi inverse of x is a stable curve. Recall stable curve means something like this. Of genus zero. So it is a union, union of P1s meeting transversally and having no cycles. Okay. This is a stable curve, so we have to prove the main point to prove is that the intersections of the components are uh, like <clears throat> a union of coordinate axes is a stable curve <clears throat> and can be equipped naturally with n marked points p1 up to pn, given by n disjoint sections sigma c from yn to yn plus 1, and they are indexed for c in n. For each label, we get a section. Yeah. So that's the result. And uh, I have 15 minutes. So the only thing I'm going to do is to show uh, why we get this kind of transversality. OK. So. <clears throat> How do I do? Yeah. Proof of transversality Of course, we also have to prove that the inverse image is consists of uh, curves, that the dimension is correct, but this will go on the way. So we write the label set here, uh, which I would call maybe write n plus 1. This is the label set here as n union A, and A is a new label. So if you have a y, if y is an n plus 1 gone, then y will be y. 1 up to yn, and then we have ya to distinguish the last one. Okay, And of course, if now pi of a string y is equal to x, and uh, y is an n plus 1 gone of the string y, then we will have that these components here now it depends. Let me write it like this. Let me write y equals yt, t in n plus 1 over 3. I hope you understand my terminology. And we assume that pi of y is x. So what happens? If our triple t involves a, if a, let me write it like this, appears in t. t is a triple. Then 
under pi, this n plus 1 gon is thrown away. Yeah? So it's kind of free. Uh, we forget about it in the projection. And actually, <clears throat> that's a case where, which is not so interesting, so I skip it. Uh, if a and t, y t is not interesting. That's not completely true, but not for today, because we don't have too much time. So let me restrict to the case where t, the triple, is already inside n, does not involve the new label a. If a is not in t, then y t, now it will project to x t, so it will be x t 1, x t 2, up to x t n. That's prescribed by the projection. And only the last one, a, is free. Okay. This will be now in p1 n plus 1. So we want to find equations only for this y a t. Okay. <clears throat> so what is the condition now to be in y n plus 1? Y so this is already the condition here is already that it maps down to x, y and y n. The condition, as always, is that the cross ratios are equal. Cross q y t or y s maybe y s equals cross q y t for all quadruples. In n plus 1, 4, for which they are defined whenever defined. And I will write down these equations. So the cross ratios, they look like, now using this one here, we will let write, take, I take a special one where you see nicely what is happening. Q is i, j, l. A for hold on a second, da 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 da. I missed something, sorry. Yeah, okay. I'm not happy. Oh, yeah, here it is. For, we have to specify s and t. For s equals i, j, k, and t equals i, j, l. So the interesting case, and I have to skip here some details, but I just want to show you the, the key, key equation. If we take here these two triples, and we take then the quadruple i, j, l, composed from these two, and the new label a, then we get. And then it, it's just like a miracle. The condition of the equality of cross ratios recalls that we have written them like this. x s i, x s j, x s l, y s a must be equal to the same with t, x i t, x j t, x l t, y t a. So this is equivalent. Now you just plug it in, and you get lengthy x i s minus x s l 
x as j minus y as a. You don't have to copy, you will get it in the notes. Then times from here we get x i t minus y t a, x j t minus x l t. And this must be equal to the same with the role exchanged, x as i minus y as a, x as j minus x as l, x i t minus x l t, x j t minus y t a. Which is equivalent, now we use, we use that s is i j k. So this one here, this guy is 0. This guy is 1. This guy, we don't know anything, but here we know even more. This one is 0, this one is 1, this one is infinity. And we want to get equations for ys and y, yta. So we plug this in, and so it is equivalent to 0 minus xsl, 1 minus ysa, 0 minus yta, 1 minus infinity, equal, you see it's uh, uh, just to compute, 1 minus x as l, 0 minus infinity, 1 minus y t a. Now, recall our rule of algebraic operations in P1. This minus infinity will cancel with this one. Yeah, you have to take care, but this will cancel. And you get the following x as l, 1 minus y as a, 0 minus y t a equals y as a times 1 minus x as l, 1 minus y t a. You simplify, and now. <laughs> I was very impressed when I got this. You end up with y s a times y t a. Recall that in our chart, the y a s and y t a are our variables. And the x's are constants. So we get the product is equal to 1 minus x s l. Now, this is a constant. Of course, I just chose very particular quadruples and very particular triples. But one can prove that these are representative for the general situation. So what kind of object is this here? You have two variables. And if xsl is different from 1, then you get a hyperbola. Yes. If this is different from 1, you get hyperbola. OK. And if x s l equals 1, you get two coordinate axes, union of coordinate axes. And that's precisely transversality. So you see, it, it falls from the sky. You just compute, and you get precisely the stable curves. Okay? I don't tell you how you get the sections. That's similarly easy. Uh, and uh, like this, you will have reconstructed the universal family of the moduli space of endpointed stable curves, which was denoted by overline script m 0 n. Okay. So excuse me if I got a little bit enthusiastic about all this. Uh, it's also the way of presenting this material here. So <clears throat> this will be a first end of our course. I will send you an email at the end of February, and then we will find out if some of you still want to continue and see more details, or maybe the interesting, the case of 
point in the plane is much more interesting and much more difficult. This would also be a good topic. But for the moment, I want to say goodbye to you. I'm very happy that you followed the course for such a long time. Thank you for your interest, for your feedback, for your patience. And I hope that we meet again very soon. Bye bye and have a wonderful vacation. Yes. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yes. I would like to ask about uh, this last uh, proof you made, and maybe you don't have to give the details now, but maybe in the notes. You more or less described how you get uh, uh, two, <coughs> two components of this stable curve, yes. and they are transversal. But uh, these stable curves also have some marked points on the components. Yes. And, and mm. maybe you would give us a hint of how to do these uh, marked points on the, on the components appear. Yes, they appear as the image, <laughs> as the image of these sections here. Yeah, we, it's very easy to define these sections. I will give it in the notes, yeah, which I will send you probably next week. And then the image will be just the points on the components. Okay? There's nothing behind. It's I will send it to you. Okay? Did you hear me? Yeah. Okay. But I did not indicate how to define how to define the section. I will do it in the notes, okay? Yeah. Thank okay, you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye-bye.